What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and in today's build I'm going to be putting together a $1200 RTX 3070 gaming PC build. I'm going to show you all the parts I selected and why, the process of putting it together step by step including all the fiddly cables and wiring before finally booting this machine up to see how it looks but more importantly how it performs in 15 of the most popular titles. So without any further ado make sure Sure to get subscribed we're closing in on a hundred thousand subscribers but let's jump into it as always i'm going to kick things off by installing our processor cpu cooler and our ram into the motherboard today this is the msi b550m mortar board it's a micro atx b550 board that's packed with a load of great features including a built-in rear io shield an m.2 slot four ram dim slots basically it's pretty well future proof and also supports the new Ryzen 5000 CPUs. I'm not going to be using one of those today though and do let me explain. Instead I've got the Ryzen 5 3600. It's the best value pairing with our graphics card today and AMD at the moment aren't yet replacing it with Ryzen 5000. I'm going to install it by kind of dropping it nicely into our socket today, lining up the golden triangle on the processor with the socket before popping that arm nicely back down. It's a great opportunity today to install our RAM or our memory. This is a 16 gigabyte kit of Thermaltake's Tough RAM. It's got a 3600 megahertz clock speed and some of the best widespread motherboard compatibility that I've seen on RAM in quite some time. To install it, we're going to head over here to our RAM DIMM slots and we're going to pull back the second and fourth clips just like so. It's then a case of lining the notch on the memory with the corresponding notch on your motherboard today and sliding the RAM nice and gently into place. It's going to clip in on each corner. This motherboard is actually not all that resistant when it comes to memory and repeat for your second RAM DIMM slot. I'm going to go about installing the CPU cooler while the motherboard is still out and easy to access. This is the Thermaltake UX200. You could stick with the Ryzen stock cooler, but for around about $38, though up-to-date pricing can be found at the links in the description below, it's a really great choice. This cooler has actually got a really clever mounting system. It just uses the basic pre-installed AMD compatible brackets which means once we've applied a little bit of thermal paste about the size of a grain of rice that's going to be more than enough today we can simply slot it on top just like this with that clip then having applied a little bit of pressure sitting just like so on this plastic bracket and that really is all there is to it. Remember as well to plug up the CPU fan header. While our motherboard is still out and easy to access, I think it's also a good idea to install the M.2 drive. This is going to be our primary storage drive today and provide about 500 gigabytes of fast and affordable storage. Specifically, this right here is the Kingston A2000. It's a really, really affordable drive that sits, of course, on the NVMe platform. Now, installing the drive is pretty simple. Much like our RAM, we're going to line up the notch on the gold interface with the notch on the M.2 slot and then slide the drive very nicely into place. Fasten it down just like so and then reapply the heatsink and we're all good to go. Now then, the motherboard assembly is all pretty much, don't know where that came from, pretty much ready to go. So we can go ahead and install it into our case today. This is from Thermaltake and it is their S100TG. It's a quite spacious but still compact micro ATX case with a tempered glass side panel and a really great price point. And we've got a peel. This case has also got one of my favorite features a case can have, which is a hinged tempered glass side panel that's really, really easy to remove. With both the side panels off then, it's a simple case of checking that where each of the holes on our motherboard is, we've got a corresponding standoff located inside of the case. In this instance, we're all good and ready to go. I'm gonna grab this included bag of case accessories from the rear of the chassis. And in here, we should find some screws that we 
we need to actually secure the motherboard into place. Okay then, the build's starting to come together. It looks quite nicely proportioned at the minute. All that's left to do then before we install the graphics card is to install the power supply. This is a Thermaltake Smart RGB 700 watts. This is gonna be more than enough for the single eight pin power connector that a typical 3070 requires. And of course, it's RGB, which always helps here on the GeekerWatt channel. The cables are a little bit ugly, so I'm gonna pair them with some cheap PSU extension cables where they're gonna be visible to make sure the build looks nice and tidy. In terms of the installation, we wanna make sure the fan is facing down as long as you're not gonna put this PC on a rug or a carpet, and that's gonna draw fresh air in from underneath the case. And we're just going to screw it in with four screws corner by corner. Now the very last thing to do before the graphics card goes in is some of our cables and wiring. The first is the largest the motherboard power connector which goes to the right hand side middle of the motherboard just like so. It's followed nice and closely by a 4 plus 4 pin CPU power connector which goes into the motherboard at the top left of our build today. Before we finally go ahead and deal with all of these, our front panel connectors. The first is the HD audio. This goes to the bottom left of the motherboard and has a pin missing, so we'll only go in one way round. It's a very similar story for USB 2, which has a different pin missing and also goes to the bottom of our motherboard today. USB 3, which is the largest of the front panel cables and powers our USB 3 ports, goes to the right hand side of our motherboard just near the bottom before we finally install the front panel cables our power reset hard drive indicator leds and all that good stuff on the top of our case they go to the bottom right hand side of the motherboard just to the left of our sata data connectors today which we aren't going to be using all right then it is finally time now to install the graphics card and this is of course the brand spanking new RTX 3070. If you haven't seen my Founders Edition builds, you can check those out in the card section here. And make sure you get subscribed. We're close to 100K for more and more 3070 content. This is the first card from a board partner, which is basically anyone other than Nvidia, that I've actually got hands on with. And off the bat, it's just a little bit of a beast. Look at the size of that 3070. Let's grab the Founders Edition actually and compare the two. So the size difference there is just absolutely mammoth. This is probably best demonstrated on the overhead camera angle, but like that is an insane difference. Look at the back profile. I know this is a flex by the way that I've got, to, yes, I've got two 3070s. MSI will probably ask for this one back soon. I mean, I'm interested to see how much better than the Founders Edition this performs and it should actually run quite a bit cooler. That's enough of the size comparisons though for today. Now this is what you call a tight fit. Holy moly. And there we have it. We're just going to secure it down with the two included screws to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. All that's really left to do then is to power the graphics card up, do a bit of cable management and then whack our side panels on before booting this thing up to see how it performs in 15 of the most popular titles. Before that though, let's see how good it looks when it's all powered up and there's only one way to do it. Roll the montage. <laughs> Okay then, now you've seen how to put this system together step by step and just how amazing it looks when it's all powered up, let's take a dive and see exactly how it performs in around 15 of the most popular titles. Starting off with one of the latest AAA titles, Death Stranding 1440p high settings with DLSS set to performance mode, rendering the game at a slightly lower resolution and using AI to upscale, you're seeing 143 FPS on average with 134 and 127 for the 90 and 99th percentiles. GTA 5 is a similarly positive story. Here you're looking at 124 FPS on average with 118 and 104 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. And that was in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. So if you want to go back and compare this build against my other content and my other systems, you can do so. Control is another one of the ray tracing -y DLSS type titles on my list today. Here at 1440p medium settings, we're looking 113 FPS on average with DLSS and RTX enabled on medium. 
102 and 96 for the 90 and 99th percentile results wasn't too shabby either. Apex Legends is a similarly positive story. Here at 1440p high settings, you look at 143 frames per second on average with 129 and 123 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Call of Duty's Warzone is another game that theoretically supports ray tracing, but actually uh, won't allow you to enable it in the Battle Royale mode. Nevertheless though, at 1440p medium settings, you look in 122 frames per second, with 90 and 99th percentile results of 104 and 90 respectively, meaning the frame rate never really went below 90 FPS, which is kind of crazy. Forza Horizon 4 is a pretty easy game to run, but one of my personal favourites. Here at 1440p Ultra settings, you're looking at 142 FPS on average, with 127 and 106 for those lower numbers respectively. Once again, always above 100 FPS is a crazy number, especially when you consider consoles will only really max out at the 60 or 70 mark in Forza Horizon 4. Overwatch is a bit of an older game on the list today, but still increasingly very popular. 1440p at ultra settings saw 243 frames per second on average, with 231 and 210 for the 90th and 99th percentile results. And that was of course with VSync disabled uh, and a render resolution of 100%. CSGO Counter-Strike Global Offensive is a game that just won't shake off my list. Everyone loves it and they go mental if it's not here, which is kind of justified. At 4K high settings, you're looking 221 FPS, which is, you know, an eSports level number for 4K high settings. Yes, if you wanted three or 400 FPS, 1080p is going to more than provide those numbers to you. But why not game in 4K if you can? Battlefield 5 is a bit more of a strenuous title to run, hence I ran it today at 1440p high settings with RTX disabled. I did of course leave DLSS enabled as that's going to give us a bit more uh, frame rate by rendering as I say before at the slightly low resolution and using AI to upscale, uh, giving us 122 FPS on average with 107 and 102 respectively for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Minecraft RTX Beta for Windows 10 is a bit of an interesting one, but something I just had to try out. 1440p with ray tracing enabled and an 8 chunk render distance, which really isn't very far, and you look in 95 FPS. This is 34 FPS faster than my previous 3070 build that was actually slightly more powerful. So I'm not really sure how that works. The game is still in beta. I did repeat to try and, you know, find out the reason for these results. But I think that's the nature of a game that's still very, very early stages, at least on the ray tracing front. Doom Eternal is next up today here at 1440p Nightmare. What a setting name. You look at 121 FPS on average uh, with 90 and 99th percentiles of 111 and 105 respectively. Visually, the game looked incredible. And it's a really, really fun title. Rainbow Six Siege is one that you guys have asked for for ages and I've, I've kind of started adding it back in. Here at 1440p very high in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, you look in 255 FPS with 90 and 99th percentile results not really wavering much below that at 233 and 223 respectively. Rainbow Six not a particularly difficult game to run, especially on a 3070. Valorant is the penultimate game on my list today and the definition of not very difficult to run. Here at 1440p high settings with NVIDIA's reflex technology enabled to bust our input lag, you look in 294 FPS on average with 266 and 247 for the 90 and 99th percentile results respectively. You can't blame low FPS in Valorant on a 3070 for not getting that W, you've got no excuses. Fortnite then is the last game today, here I tested it at 1440p high with NVIDIA's lag busting reflex technology enabled and DLSS turned on with ray tracing turned off. Here you look in 237 FPS on average with a 90 and 99th percentile result of 221 and 204 respectively. Fortnite giving us some very good numbers here today as you would expect and the game looked absolutely fantastic. With that being said though, that not only wraps it up for pretty much all the games today, but the whole video. If you did enjoy it, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed if you want to see more from me. Thank you very much for watching though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.